So it seems like now the major tech companies are rolling out their AI coding assistants and they are extremely comprehensive and very impressive. So we have two examples of that. We have one from GitHub, which is Microsoft, and they call it GitHub Copilot Workspace. And then we have Amazon's version, which is Amazon Q, which they just rolled out. Plus we have a few other news stories that we're gonna get to today. So let's get into it. First, this is GitHub Copilot Workspace. And this is the evolution of the GitHub Copilot project, which was really the first AI coding assistant. And it was incredible. You just start typing some code and it fills out the entire method or even entire pages of code for you. And now GitHub Copilot Workspace takes it a step further. You start from the task. You start by defining what you want to accomplish, whether that's solving a GitHub issue or defining a new feature and it builds the entire thing for you. It's really the next generation of AI coding assistance. So this is the blog post about it. Right here they say, in 2022, we launched GitHub Copilot as an autocomplete pair programmer in the editor, boosting developer productivity by up to 55%. Now, one critique of GitHub Copilot is that you are reusing code that you're not really even looking at, and it's potentially suboptimal code or even code that might have bugs in it. And so many people are reusing the same code over and over again, and all of that is going back into the model to train it. Maybe we're actually degrading the median baseline of code quality, which is something interesting to think about. Uh, then in 2023, we released GitHub Copilot Chat, which is essentially like ChatGPT, but with code. Honestly, it's not super impressive. I never used it. It's kind of just like taking your code base, putting it into ChatGPT, and then asking questions about it. And it's not even that good. It's certainly not nearly as powerful as GitHub Copilot Autocomplete. Now we have GitHub Copilot Workspace. Developers can now brainstorm, plan, build, test, and run code in natural language. This new task-centric experience leverages different Copilot-powered agents from start to finish, while giving developers full control over every step of the process. This is essentially Microsoft's version of Devon. All right, so we have an example of how it works. What we're seeing here is an issue, a GitHub issue. Create an AI player option, and then we have a description of what it should be. So then we have that, we can open it in workspace, then the AI actually fills out a much more detailed specification for this issue. And then what we can do is click this generate plan button. We can edit any of the details along the way, as it says here, we can add parts to the spec. It's now generating a plan. And then we can actually just click implement and it's gonna show us the diff right here. So all we had to do was describe what we want to build and then it built it with the diff in a really nice interface. And it's gonna go step by step and accomplish every one of the specifications in the issue or in the plan. Then we can actually open it in a live preview so you can test it out before merging the code. There it is, so all within this one environment and then we can actually create the pull request and merge the code. So very, very cool. And I think what's interesting about GitHub Copilot is they're not claiming to replace developers. They are claiming to augment developers. And I really actually believe that with this purpose, you still need to review the code. You still need to review the specifications, but I think this is gonna give many more people the ability to contribute to code bases. And right here it says, and is expressly designed to deliver, not replace developer creativity faster and easier than ever before. So again, it all starts with a task. Then we build a full plan and it actually builds it for us and we can edit it. Then we can create the code and again, completely editable. Then we test out the code. We actually see it running and then we can create a pull request and merge the code. So let me show you a video of it working end to end. And this is from the GitHub Copilot team. So well, let's watch this video together. It's about two minutes. Getting started with your work usually takes place looking at a project board and navigating to GitHub issues. Copilot Workspace brings your favorite AI assistant into a native dev environment designed for everyday tasks. For example, it can use the information in your GitHub issue, along with references from your repository, to build out a specification based on the current state and proposed state. And you can tailor the spec as you need, whether that's adding, editing, or removing items. Once ready, you can progress from spec to plan, and the process feels familiar. With the ability to adjust the plan as you need by creating, modifying, or removing files, and adjusting the expected tasks for each step. This leaves you in control, free to solve the higher level problems and build out your plan before getting into the finer details of writing code. 
Copilot Workspace then streams the suggested changes to our environment. Notice that we have a diff view to easily digest the changes and can easily make updates within the editor. But that's not all. At our fingertips, we have access to an integrated terminal so we can run the tests in our workspace before committing our changes and creating a pull request. And what if you want to make use of advanced features like step through debugging? No problem. Create a code space and pick up where you left off. When you raise your pull request with Copilot Workspace, it generates a description for you and automatically adds a link to your workspace, adding a little bit more context for the reviewer and supporting their code review workflow. And as it's a pull request, our usual checks trigger, including GitHub Action Workflows and code scanning. Copilot Workspace leaves you in control, solving the high level problems and iterating quickly over the solution. And it is mobile compatible. So you're going to be able to do all of this from your mobile phone, which is kind of insane to think about. You can be coding and actually contributing real code to a project from your phone from anywhere in the world. Next, we have Amazon Q. And Amazon Q is a generative AI powered assistant for businesses and developers and is now generally available. Now I haven't played with it yet, but what's interesting is this is Amazon's attempt at their own large language model. And I think they rolled their own, but they don't really give any specifications about it. And it comes in four flavors. And I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. So a little bit about it, Amazon Q not only generates highly accurate code, it also tests, debugs, and have multi-step planning and reasoning capabilities that can transform and implement new code generated from developer requests. Amazon Q also makes it easier for employees to get answers to questions across business data, such as company policies, et cetera. So again, four different use cases, and we're gonna take a look at each. So first is Amazon Q developer, and it's very similar to what we just looked at. Amazon Q assists developers and IT professionals with all of their tasks from coding, testing, and upgrading applications to troubleshooting, performing security scanning and fixes, and optimizing AWS resources. So let's take a look at a quick demo video and I'll walk you through what we're seeing. So first is Amazon Q Business and Really what this is, is just a large language model. So write a job posting. This is essentially a prompt you could put into any large language model and it generates a job posting. Not super impressive. Now, what I'm really interested in is Amazon Q developer. So you can ask it questions and what we're seeing here is transforming code. So it's actually converting it into Java 8, for example. It doesn't seem quite as impressive as GitHub Copilot workspace, but that's pretty cool. It dynamically generates or I believe it dynamically generated that interface to upgrade. And here we go. So it's doing that upgrade now. Now we have Amazon Q and Amazon QuickSight. And QuickSight, by the way, is just a business intelligence tool. That just means you dump a bunch of your business data in there and you can analyze it really easily. And I think this is a really underappreciated use case, especially as a business. You need data analysts, data scientists to do this work. But now you can essentially just describe the types of metrics that you want to see. And Amazon QuickSight with Amazon Q is going to put it all together for you. So here we go. Build a story explaining profitability trends. And again, it can be very abstract like that. And it puts together an entire report with graphs and everything. That's super, super impressive. And look at all these suggestions of different metrics you can run, all generated by AI. Very, very cool. Then they have Amazon Q apps, which says it enables employees to use natural language to securely build their own generative AI applications. And it's all from the company's data. So Amazon Q is really positioned to be the business product. So employees simply describe the type of app they want in natural language and Q apps will quickly generate an app that accomplishes their desired task. So let's look at this quick example, build an app that takes a role title and onboarding plan structure weekly, 60, 90 day, and optionally a new hire's name, it should output a summary of the role guidelines for the given role. So it's essentially using AI to build really simple applications to be used within the work environment. And so you generate these applications and then they can be used over and over again. Kind of cool, I've not really seen this elsewhere. Uh, it's kind of neat. And so that's all for Amazon Q. I haven't tested it myself. It looks pretty cool though, so I might go and test it. Next, Rabbit R1. So I have my Rabbit R1 right here. It's actually gotten much much better since I've gotten it. One of my biggest complaints was the fact that the battery drained really quickly. And then with one update, it improved probably about 10x for me. So where previously I could literally stare at the device and watch the battery drain percent by percent, 
Now it lasts for two hours and only drains about 5% of battery. So a vast improvement and really it actually makes it usable now. But what now Ars Technica has broke is that the Rabbit R1 AI box is revealed to be just an Android app. However, it's not really breaking anything. We kind of knew that. They announced that the underlying operating system, at, and they announced it a while ago, is Android. And so, yeah, of course, it's just kind of an Android app. And so what somebody was actually able to do is get the Rabbit app working on an Android phone, which is pretty interesting. And so here we can actually see the Rabbit app working on a phone. That is the Rabbit app. And so the company posted on X that they are aware there are some unofficial Rabbit OS app website emulators out there. But look, of course it can be an app. I like the form factor. I like the hardware. It's gorgeous to me. It feels nice. I know I'm a sucker for this kind of stuff, but I really appreciate it. And of course, I don't know why they're not just also building an app. I, I guess that would cannibalize their hardware market, but for $200, it seems worth it to me. And of course, if you don't want to buy it, just don't buy it. And if you want to load it up on your own device in a kind of hacked way, you're welcome to do that, of course. Next, Sam Altman said some very interesting things about GPT-5 and GPT-4. So he talks about a lot of stuff at this Stanford talk. So let's go through a few of them. One, he is asked like what he thinks about right now. And his answer is how to build really big computers. And we already know he was trying to raise seven, eight trillion dollars. We already know that Microsoft is building the biggest supercomputer ever made on behalf of really open AI. So he is thinking about this deeply. I've also said multiple times, models are becoming commoditized. That is not where the value is going to be. What questions then are you wrestling with that no one else is talking about? How to build really big computers. I mean, I think other people are talking about that, but we're probably like looking at it through a lens that no one else is quite imagining yet. And can we continue on that thread then of how to build really big computers? If that's really what's on your mind, can you share? I know there's been a lot of speculation and a, a, probably a lot of hearsay too about the semiconductor foundry endeavor that you are reportedly embarking on. Um, can you share what would make, what, what's the vision? Yeah, what would make this different than it's not others really that are out there? It's not just foundries, although that, that's part of it. It's like, if, if you believe, which we increasingly do at this point, that AI infrastructure is going to be one of the most important inputs to the future, this commodity that everybody's going to want. And that is energy, data centers, chips, chip design, new kinds of networks. It's, it's how we look at that entire ecosystem um, and how we make a lot more of that. And I don't think it'll work to just look at one piece or another, but we, we got to do the whole thing. Okay, so there's multiple big problems. Yeah, um, I think like just this is the arc of human technological history as we build bigger and more complex systems. Another thing he talks about, and I'll show you the clip in a second, is the fact that they're not sure how to productize PhD level intelligence and how to actually deliver the most value to the world, which is kind of interesting. They're kind of building the plane in the air while flying it, which makes me a little bit nervous, but I tend to be an optimist. So I have some good outlook on what the future of AI will be. I mean, we're, we're definitely wrestling with how we, when we make not just like grade school or middle school or level intelligence, but like PhD level intelligence and beyond, the best way to put that into a product, the best way to have a positive impact with that on society and people's lives, we don't know the answer to that yet. So I think that's like a pretty important thing to figure out. And he also talks about AGI, the AGI timeline, how GPT-4 is embarrassing at best, which is interesting. It kind of leads me to believe he's seen something much better internal at OpenAI. Let's watch what he has to say about that. OpenAI is phenomenal. ChatGPT is phenomenal. Um, everything else, all the other models are phenomenal. It burnt, you burned $520 million of cash last year. That doesn't concern you in terms of thinking about the economic model of how do you actually, where's going to be the monetization source? Well, first of all, that's nice of you to say, but ChatGPT is not phenomenal. Like ChatGPT is like mildly embarrassing at best. Um, GPT-4 is the dumbest model any of you will ever, ever have to use again by a lot. Um, but, you know, it's like important to ship early and often. And we believe in iterative deployment. Like if we go build AGI in a basement and then, you know, the world is like kind of, blissfully walking blindfolded along. Um, I don't think that's like, I don't think that makes us like very good neighbors. Um, 
So I think it's important, given what we believe is going to happen, to express our view about what we believe is going to happen. Um, but more than that, the way to do it is to put the product in people's hands um, and let society co-evolve with the technology, let society tell us what it collectively and people individually want from the technology, how to productize this in a way that's going to be useful, um, where the model works really well, where it doesn't work really well, um, give our leaders and institutions time to react, um, give people time to figure out how to integrate this into their lives, to learn how to use the tool. Um, I'm sure some of you all like cheat on your homework with it, but some of you all probably do like very amazing, wonderful things with it too. Um, and as each generation goes on, uh, I think that will expand. And that means that we ship imperfect products, um, but we, we have a very tight feedback loop and we learn and we get better. And it does kind of suck to ship a product that you're embarrassed about, but it's much better than the alternative. Um, and in this case in particular, where I think we really owe it to society to deploy iteratively, one thing we've learned is that AI and surprise don't go well together. People don't want to be surprised. People want a gradual rollout and the ability to influence these systems. Um, that's how we're going to do it. There could totally be things in the future that would change where we think iterative deployment isn't such a good strategy, but it does feel like the current best approach that we have. And I think we've gained a lot um, from, from doing this and you know, hopefully the larger world has gained something too. Now here's a clip where he talks about some of the dangers of AGI and I'll play that quickly. Do you think the biggest danger from AGI is gonna come from a cataclysmic event which you know, makes all the papers or is it gonna be more subtle and pernicious? Sort of like, you know, like how everybody has ADD right now from you know, using TikTok. Right. Um, is it a, are you more concerned about the subtle dangers or the cataclysmic dangers? Um, or neither? I'm more concerned about the subtle dangers because I think we're more likely to overlook those. The cataclysmic dangers uh, a lot of people talk about and a lot of people think about. And I don't want to minimize those. I think they're really serious and, and a real thing. But I think we at least know to look out for that and spend a lot of effort. Um, the example you gave of everybody getting ADD from TikTok or whatever, I don't think we knew to look out for. And the unknown unknowns are really hard, and so I'd worry more about those, although I worry about both. And are they unknown unknowns? Are there any that you can name that you're particularly worried about? Well, then I would kind of, they'd be unknown unknown. Um, <laughs> well, you can. I am worried just about, so, so even though I think in the short term things change less than we think, as with other major technologies, in the long term I think they change more than we think. And I am worried about what rate society can adapt to something so new and how long it'll take us to figure out the new social contract versus how long we get to do it. Um, I'm worried about that. So he actually has an entire talk. It's really interesting. I'll drop the link to that in the description below. I might actually make a full video just on the talk because he talks about a lot of interesting stuff. Let me know if you want to see that. All right, next, an article from VentureBeat, but really the gist is we have our first full music video completely generated by Sora. And if you haven't heard of Sora, it is the text to video product that OpenAI kind of previewed a few months back. Really mind blowing stuff. Let me show you some brief clips. I'm not sure if I'm going to get copyrighted for the music, so I'm just going to replace it for some different music. So it might seem a little off, but let me just show you the Sora part because that's the interesting part. Karma, got a thing for me. We hold hands, make plans, keep the receipts. Karma, she's my best friend. One step closer, here's how it ends. Karma, got a thing for me. You see, you'll be digging up six feet. Karma, never let me down. My smile will kill when I cut you out. And the last story, just a quick one, MyShell AI released Open Voice V2, which is an open voice cloning project, kind of like Eleven Labs, but open source. And apparently it works really well. Let's look at the video demo. Open Voice, instantly call any voice through generate speech in any style at any language. We are conflating a lot of things with the word intelligence. Ethical concerns surround AI societal impact. Three, two, one. Ethical concerns surround AI societal impact. Wanders and watches with eager ears. The aroma of freshly baked bread filled the kitchen. The aroma of freshly baked bread filled the kitchen. The aroma of freshly baked bread filled the kitchen. We are conflating a lot of things with the word intelligence. Rest early. Rest early. 
So that works really well. If you wanna see a tutorial for how to get that installed and how to use it, let me know in the comments. If you liked this video, please consider giving a like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.